Hello, everybody, and welcome to our event today. This is the fourth webinar in our military history program series. And today we are very happy to bring to you Dr. Spencer Jones, who's going to be speaking to us about the Boer War 1899 to 1902, Scorched Earth, Concentration Camps and Methods of Barbarism. So just to keep you all updated with the rules for today, this is a public event open to everybody. So the entire proceedings, including the question and answer session, are going to be on the record. That means we're streaming live now and everything is going to be recorded. Um, and just before we get started, I'd just like to take a second um, to dis ask everybody to acknowledge the recent passing of David O'Mara. David was really active in the Twitter community and sharing his knowledge on the French army and dog tags. Um, and his passing has been a great loss to many of us, including some of the individuals in the audience tonight. So as we move in over to our guest, let me introduce him to you. So Dr. Spencer Jones is an award-winning historian and author. He is a senior lecturer in armed forces and war studies at the University of Wolverhampton and serves as a regimental historian for the Royal Regiment of Artillery. His key works include From Boer War to World War, Tactical Reform of the British Army, 1902 to 1914, and Stemming the Tide, Officers and Leadership in the British Expeditionary Force, 1914, which was runner up for the Templar Medal in 2014. He has published several critically acclaimed books on the British Army in the First World War, including Courage Without Glory, The British Army on the Western Front, 1915, and At All Costs, The British Army on the Western Front, 1916. So over to you, Spencer. And sorry, before we go over to you, um, again, an update on how this is going to run. Spencer's going to be talking for approximately 40 minutes today. If you've got any questions, please drop them in the question and answer box below, not the chat box. Um, please feel free to drop your questions during the presentation and after, and we'll have some time to go through your questions at the end. So over to you, Spencer. Uh, hello, uh, let me just share my slides. There we go. I hope everyone can see them now. Uh, my video has been disabled. I'm not sure if that's intentional or not, Sarah, but um, I'll assume that nobody wants to see my face just now. But uh, welcome everybody who has... Ah, there we go. That's starting. So there we go. hello, everyone. And welcome to this evening's talk. As Sarah's just suggested, I'm going to be talking for about 40 minutes on the subjects of the scorched earth concentration camps and methods of barbarism in the Second Boer War. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end, but if you'd like to pick this debate up with me further, or you've got further queries that aren't addressed in this, you can find me on Twitter at Historia1914, and I'd be happy to engage with you if you have questions that I don't address here. What this talk is going to be is essentially a tour of the horizon of a very contentious, very controversial, and of course, ultimately, a terribly costly in human terms period of the war in South Africa being fought between the British Empire and the Afrikaner Republics of Transvaal, also known as the South African Republic, and the Orange Free State. It's not going to be a complete history of the war. Instead, I want to focus in on the series of events that would lead to the British instituting a scorched earth policy, which in turn led to the creation of concentration camps. And I'd like to explore some of the controversies of those camps and, of course, the terrible human cost that they would ultimately wreak upon their inmates. So to begin, it's necessary to just have a brief overview of how the war had come about, the position in which the combatant powers found themselves by 1900, and a little bit about the geography of this conflict. So this conflict was, of course, fought in southern Africa, illustrated here, map courtesy of the National Army Museum, between the British Empire attempting to uh, overwhelm, ultimately, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. The war had broken out in October 1899 when the Boer republics, feeling themselves backed into a political corner, had actually declared war upon Britain rather than face what they assumed would be an inevitable invasion. And for a period of the war, the war actually swung in the Boer's favour, particularly between October and December 1899, culminating in a series of British defeats known as Black Week in December 1899. But from that point, the uh, British Empire redoubled its efforts to win this war. Rather than accepting a political compromise, as the Boers hoped, instead reinforcements poured into southern Africa and would lead and spearhead an invasion of the Boer republics beginning in February 1900, which completely turned the tide of the war. And up to this point, the Boers had been able to dictate the place and indeed the tempo of war from February 1900 onwards. Instead, the war came to the Boer republics themselves, beginning with an invasion of Orange Free State, which took the capital of that, that country, Bloemfontein, on the map by March 
The invasion continued moving through Orange Free State, ultimately into Transvaal, entering Transvaal in May 1900, and essentially conquering Transvaal, dispersing the last organized armies of the Boer forces by August 1900. And indeed, at this point, the war, certainly to many in the British military, appeared to be over. The overwhelming numerical superiority of the British army had ultimately swept aside the small militia forces of the Boers, and all that seemed to be left was a, uh, a mopping up, if you will, of a few bitter enders who refused to surrender, and the reorganisation of these two nations. And indeed, as part of this, both, Blomfant, both Orange Free State and Transvaal were annexed into the British Empire, probably prematurely, but an indicator of the confidence that the British military felt that it had conquered these countries, and ultimately it was on the brink of complete victory. But this was wrong. It was wrong for several reasons, but the crucial reason, reason was that although occupying the capitals of Orange Free State and Transvaal crippled the ability of the Boer republics to make conventional war, it did not limit their ability to make a guerrilla war. The Boer military is just worthy of some short comment here. It was not a formalized military. Only a few specialist branches, such as the artillery, were full-time soldiers. The remainder of it was brought together through the commando system, whereby able-bodied burghers, citizens of the Boer Republics between 16 and 60 would be called up to, for service and would be expected to report for action with a rifle, ammunition, rations, and their own horse. If anything was lacking, Boer governments would provide for them. Units would be formed into a commando, would elect their own officers, and then would then enter the field. And the name commando in at the Afrikaans language has no special connotation. But as we know in the English language, it's synonymous with special forces. And that is a legacy of the Boer War. Winston Churchill chose the name commando in 1940 with quite specific reference to what had happened to the British Army in 19, uh, 1900 when it faced a different type of commando. From March 1900 onwards, as the Boers were slowly driven back uh, by the overwhelming force of the British Army, some Boer commandos and Boer units had become stuck behind British lines. Now, some of those units had surrendered, but others had continued the fight. And crucially, in March 1900, at a, a quite stormy meeting in the Orange Free State, there was an acceptance amongst some, not all, but some Boer leaders, that the way to continue the war was not to try and fight the British conventionally, but instead to wage a guerrilla campaign, targeting the railways in particular that the British relied upon. There were four main railways, only four, which fed the British armies in the Orange Free State and Transvaal. They were very long, they were impossible to defend along their entire length at this stage, and Boers reasoned if they could continuously attack these railways, they could potentially uh, slow down or possibly even halt the British army entirely. That decision was made in March, and early Boer commando raids in March 1900 behind British lines proved extremely successful. By August 1900, with the Boer forces in Transvaal also overrun, even the last few remaining Boers who had rejected guerrilla tactics initially realised this was the only way to continue the fight. And from essentially September 1900 onwards, all remaining Boer commandos in the field began to scatter, they divided and subdivided, and started carrying out guerrilla warfare against the British in the occupied territories, but also spreading that guerrilla warfare over time into British South Africa, Cape Colony, and Natal. The Boers were especially well equipped for this. They knew the land extremely well. In many cases, they were fighting in defense of their homelands. They had a culture of independence and initiative, and the Boer fighters themselves, although without military training, came from a culture where uh, marksmanship, where gun culture was predominant, as was skill at riding the horse. They were essentially a superb set of raw material for mounting a guerrilla campaign. And it proved frustratingly effective for the British. Attacks behind the lines, and particularly attacks on British, the British rail transport that was feeding the army as it advanced, proved extremely effective and prompted something of a crisis in the British army about how to deal with it. And this exposed an important rift, and this rift will be important for the remainder of this um, this lecture as well. An important rift between the civil authorities embodied by the High Commissioner of South Africa on the left, Alfred Milner, and the military authorities embodied by the two principal commanders in this period, Lord Roberts in the centre, who commanded essentially from January to November 1900, and Lord Kitchener, who would command for the remainder of the war. The problem boiled down to how to approach this intractable difficulty of Boer guerrillas operating in occupied territory. Milner favoured more of a civil solution, and although he's 
views were not pressed particularly hard. His general view, and this was a consistent one, was that the way to win the Boers over was through conciliatory tactics to actually try and restore normalcy to the occupied territories and try and bring them into the wider British South Africa as soon as possible. But the problem was his authority on military operations in Orange Free State and Transvaal was very limited, and the actual boundaries of authority were never clearly outlined. Milner himself was no soldier, and he tended to defer to the soldierly opinion with military matters. Milner did, to an extent, forge a working relationship with the man in the centre, Lord Roberts, who commanded the invasion forces through January to November 1900. Roberts favoured fairly violent reprisals against Boers who committed guerrilla tactics, but Milner at times was able to steer him away from this, although the two of them never quite developed a unified policy, and there was always tension between their interactions. And as we'll see, Roberts's policy of reprisals against the Boers would ultimately grow in violence and intensity, despite Milner's urgings to reduce it and to try to uh, adopt a more conciliatory approach. On the other hand, Lord Kitchener, who took over uh, from Lord Roberts after Roberts's departure, had a very poor relationship with Milner and essentially didn't listen to him at all. Had very little, the two of them had could not see eye to eye. They were radically different personalities. And Milner's urging to try and take a more conciliatory approach fell on completely deaf ears with Kitchener, as we will see. But the tensions between where civil authority began and indeed ended, and the same with the military authority, would hamper both the British response to guerrilla warfare and, as we'll see, would also play a role in the tragedy of the concentration camps in some in a future point. The military response to Boer guerrilla tactics was direct and it was brutal. It was to essentially t uh, take uh, um, punish the Boers by destroying civilian property and trying to uh, limit Boer access to civilian sources of supply, both actual physical supply and also simply emotional and indeed social support. Destruction of property had been a feature of the Boer War from the very earliest days, but it had occurred sporadically, irregularly, and without either army's approval. Neither the Boers nor the British gave it full approval. But faced with guerrilla war from May 1900 onwards, and indeed perhaps even earlier than this time, the British responded to attacks upon the railway line by finding nearby Boer farms, properties, the Boers were an overwhelmingly rural society, finding their properties and destroying them as a form of punishment for allowing uh, an attack on the railway in this region to occur. And this, this burning, this destruction of property was initially targeted in areas where guerrillas were felt to be uh, in action. It was also targeted against farms that were felt to be harboring or supporting guerrillas. But gradually from May 1900 over the coming months as Boer guerrilla activity increased, British farm burning increased in proportion. And by September 1900, widespread and indiscriminate destruction of Boer property had become the norm without official sanction, or at least with only vague official sanction, but the implications given to commanders in the field were clear that any uh, Boer property that had any seeming connection to the Boers was liable, Boer fighters, that should say, was liable for destruction. Now, within this, there was also a, 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 an oddity within how the British approached destroying Boer property. And this was because some Boers who had surrendered to the British, who'd either been taken prisoner or they'd simply chosen to lay down their arms, so, uh, quite a large proportion of male Boers had been sent back to their homes. They'd been denuded of their weapons, they'd been forced to agree to an oath of loyalty, and then they'd been allowed to return home. Now, a portion of these men who'd returned home then actually rejoined the commandos as guerrilla warfare became more prominent and prevalent. But other Boers stayed at home and actually refused to join, and they found themselves trapped in a firing line because British, British were roaming the countryside indiscriminately destroying property, but they would avoid, or at least theoretically avoid, destroying the property of those who had oaths of loyalty. But this made those with the oaths prime targets for Boer commandos themselves, who would descend upon these unblemished properties, destroy them in turn, or force the men at, point, at gunpoint, in many cases, to rejoin the fighting forces. And so from September onwards, there was a growing pressure, indeed from May onwards, I should say, there was growing pressure from those Boers who had surrendered and had their uh, oaths of loyalty 
towards there was growing pressure from them towards the British to provide some form of protection because they were being caught in a crossfire for which, for which they had no defence. And as early as May 1900, there was a proposal to create a protected camp for these refugees who had surrendered, who were trying to avoid reprisals from the Boer commandos. But by September, October, as the Boer War, as the um, guerrilla war intensified, even those with oaths of loyalty began to find their properties being destroyed. And this was creating a growing refugee crisis, both those trying to seek protection from Boer commandos and those who'd had their properties destroyed by the British and had nowhere else to go. And the refugee problem was growing throughout 1900. The first ad hoc camps, not yet called concentration camps, first one appeared in July 1900 around Mafeking, and it was actually a wagon train camp. The camps themselves, they, which will become the concentration camps, were officially established in December 1900 in response to this growing and largely British caused refugee crisis. Initially, the refugees would try and go to cities or towns, or if they had family there, they'd try and connect with those. But as more and more farms and, and indeed villages were destroyed, thousands of Boers found themselves homeless, wandering the wilderness and in need of somewhere to go. And to try and cope with this refugee crisis, the British founded the camp system in December 1900. These camps were intended to house both refugees, those carrying oaths of loyalty, those who had um, reason to seek British protection, and also what the British called undesirables, which was the families of those men who were still out fighting with the guerrillas and were involved in guerrilla warfare. For the most part, concentration camp inmates were women and children with some old men and also some able-bodied men. These were generally those men who had oaths of loyalty, but as we'll hear, those able-bodied men generally didn't stay in the camp for very long. There were also some blacks who had joined the, who were, who were members of the family, essentially, domestic servants, maids, um, and other um, parts of the family. A legacy in some ways of the rather peculiar Boer African relations at this stage, but that's something we can perhaps pick up in the Q&A. The, so the camps were overwhelmingly women, children, and the elderly. In total, there were at least 40 camps. The total number is somewhat confusing because in some cases, camps moved. In some cases, camps were disbanded and their inmates were self sent elsewhere. Um, depending on how one calculates them, there was at least, there may have been as many as 44, possibly even more, but at least 40 is a widely agreed number. Now, as you can see, the camps were tented. This is a, a neatly laid out. Uh, camp, but notice how close the tents are together. And these tents could were, were deemed by the British authorities capable of holding up to 10 people, uh, which of course would actually make those tents extraordinarily crowded. The tents themselves were not particularly efficient. They were extraordinarily hot during the day. All they did was keep the sun out, but they turned the interior into something of a furnace. They were cold during colder weather, and they weren't particular, particularly waterproof. And in the heavy storms and periods of rains that South Africa sometimes experiences, they frequently soaked through and made it very unpleasant for them, uh, for those inside them. Rations were provided for those at the camps, but they were universally bland and quite frequently of low quality. Initially, there were two ration scales, one for those who had oaths of loyalty and the one for those who were deemed undesirables, but that distinction was soon deemed unworkable and was abandoned. But the rations that were available were extraordinarily bland. Some meat, if it was available, often of quite poor quality, some corn, uh, some, uh, some flour, some sugar, some milk, condensed milk, I might add, some coffee. Crucially lacking was fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, and any form of fresh dairy products. And this meant that the diet itself, although reasonably high in calories when it was fully available, was actually lacking in nutrition, especially nutrition that would be suitable for children. And this would become a serious problem as the war ground on. A point to make about the camps is the lack of uniformity to them. As I say, there are at least 40 camps, and these camps could vary quite wildly. In the very best cases, these camps featured permanent dwellings, permanent constructed dwellings, usually out of wood, but sometimes out of, uh, out of brick. A, a variety of amenities could be included in the camp, including schools, churches, shops, uh, and, um, and, uh, and other, uh, other advant advant advantageous buildings. Hospitals were meant to be included with all camps, and indeed they eventually were, but we'll hear more about those later. But that was the ideal. Other camps were unsanitary, poorly laid out, poorly organized, dismally run, 
and featured an assortment of terrible problems of which would ultimately lead to outright disaster. And so the camps varied quite remarkably. It was largely based on where they were sited. It was based on a number of other factors, which we'll explore in a little, a little while. Camps could be found in Transvaal, Orange Free State, Natal and Cape Colony. But the camps in Orange Free State and Transvaal were worse, noticeably worse, than those in British held South Africa. And the camps in Transvaal were considered worse still than Orange Free State. They struggled to receive rations. Some of the camps were built in the malarial zone, which of course created terrible problems for the inmates' health. And other problems would emerge there, which we'll discuss later. Some camps were, were surrounded by barbed wire, all camps were guarded, but there was this complex system of passes which would allow boar inmates to travel to and from the camp and to anything nearby, such as towns or other um, so, uh, other place they might might wish to visit. But a, a complex pass system was in, um, in operation to allow or indeed prevent this movement from taking place. Strictly speaking, boars were free to leave the camps, but the problem was there was nowhere for them to go. Their property had been destroyed. They would simply be wandering into the wilderness uh, with no hope of going. This did not extend to able-bodied men who could only leave the camp under strict past provisions. The camp structures then varied. Some were good, others were absolutely dreadful. Crucially, all of them were becoming overcrowded within just a few months of their institution. Remember, they instituted in December 1900. By March 1901, about 44,000 Boer civilians were in the camps, and about 9,000 African citizens were in African camps, which I'll discuss a little later. But this number more than doubled by September 1901. From March, when you had 44,000, by September 1901, there were 110,000 Boer refugees in the various camps. So the, the numbers had increased dramatically. And what had increased them was the intensity of the British scorched earth campaign, the war against Boer property. Whereas previously farm burning had been aimed at uh, as a form of reprisals against Boer attacks, now it was simply indiscriminate, a way of scorching the earth and denying the Boer guerrillas any form of food or support. And it was becoming more and more intense. Indeed, it became the only really uh, major British military policy to solving the problem, simply devastate the surrounding country, denude the guerrillas of all possible sources of supply and hope that they would become exhausted. And problems and disaster were simply, were, were soon to come around the corner for these camps. A searing French cartoon here, part of a series, in fact, published in late 1901. The problems in the camp system were there from inception. The camps were initially militarily run. They were cited with military thoughts in mind, usually relatively close to a source of supply, but no other great considerations given to them. Access to clean water, access to fuel for fires or fuel for or material for construction, little consideration was given to these. And many were placed in appalling positions where they would be flooded during the rain or scorched during the sun. Kitchener did not particularly want the camps and actually handed over military authority to civilian authorities in early 1901. But the civilian authorities found it no easier to run the camps than the military had done. Finding staff was excruciatingly difficult. The camp superintendents, who had enormous authority in the camps, were recruited from a broad spectrum of backgrounds, almost none of which had any relevance for the running of a refugee camp. No training whatsoever was given to these superintendents and their own staff underneath them were a, a pretty much a ragtag selection of whoever was available. Crucially, good staff in the camps, notably good medical staff, were in terribly short supply. Trained doctors and nurses were almost always hoovered up by the military and taken to military hospitals instead, leaving behind amateurs and in some cases frauds and chances uh, to provide much of the medical support for the Boer concentration camps. Those trained doctors and nurses who remained found themselves terribly overworked, constantly short of medical supplies, and facing an inmate uh, population who regarded them with utmost suspicion. As I've mentioned, the food supplies provided were uh, reasonably high in calories, but were very low in nutrition, especially for children, which weakened children who were already suffering under the African heat and in inappropriate accommodation. Sanitary arrangements in the camps were also often very, very poor. Again, this was partially a legacy of where they'd been placed. They weren't built with a view to having so many inmates in them. They were built by the military 
no great consideration given to how these arrangements be developed. Uh, but the sanitary arrangements were appalling and shocked onlookers. And part of the reason for this was a large number of the inmates were bywinners who were extremely poor rural bores, who landless squatters in, in many ways, who even bore inmates were shocked by how backward the bywinners could be. And in combination with inadequate positioning, inadequate materials to actually provide sanitation, and ignorance from certain elements of the, the inmate population, the sanitation arrangements were appalling and became huge vectors uh, and huge sources of disease for those who were living there. The problems were not easily solved, and it's worth considering what made a better camp or a worse camp Emily Hobhouse, who we'll hear about a little bit more in a, a moment, an investigator and, of course, pivotal in exposing the horrors of the concentration camps, identified five key factors which made a camp good or bad. First and foremost, the ability of the superintendent was extremely important. Superintendents who could organise their camps, who could fight the authorities for resources, who could put the effort in, even in the face of a very, very hostile inmate population, could turn their camps into something cleaner and safe, if not necessarily pleasant. But superintendents who didn't have this ability, who, couldn't who didn't have access to resources, who didn't have the will or the skills to fight these battles with the authorities, were ultimately responsible for many of the horrors that would occur in these camps. The proximity of camps to wood and water was important. Obviously, water, water is obvious and wood was crucial for firewood and construction. The distance from a town or a British base was important. The further away, the harder it was to get supplies and frequently the rations would be disrupted. Public opinion as well was very important. Before Hobhouse broke the story, very few people in Britain knew about the horrors of the concentration camps. Afterwards, the mood changed. And finally, the date started. Generally, older concentration camps, those started early on, had been developed more by mid-1901, and therefore they had better resources, although this wasn't always the case. But all these problems, overcrowding, inappropriate accommodation, poor sanitary arrangements and dismal rations, contributed to a devastating epidemic, which began to develop in the mid part of 1901, uh, in the South African winter. And it took the form of a wave, essentially, of related epidemics. The two most important and devastating diseases being measles, which swept through the children's population of just about all of the concentration camps, and typhoid fever, which affected adults and children equally. Children who survived measles frequently succumbed to typhoid or sometimes vice versa. And atop this pneumonia, which seized upon, of course, weakened and unwell and um, sickly children and adults alike, extracted an appalling toll. The epidemic began around about August, in some cases a little bit earlier. By October 1901, it was at its peak with staggering mortality rate. 3,205 civilians died in October alone. Remember, this is out of a population of about 1,115, sorry, um, 100,000, 115,000 inmates. The mortality rate during this period was possibly as high as 30% of the camp population uh, in certain camps. So it was an absolutely appalling period of epidemic. The epidemic ultimately didn't completely abate. It began to abate in early 1902, but it, mortality rates in the camps didn't drop completely to their pre-epidemic levels until around about April, May 1902, when the war was essentially coming to an end. And it was this period of epidemic which would ultimately um, lead to the great scandal within the British Empire and indeed the, the portrayal of the concentration camps that this cartoon lampoons. The person who broke the story was, of course, the lady on our left, Emily Hobhouse, a liberal reformer, campaigner, uh, and in many ways an investigator, who had gone out as part of a charity mission in December 1900, intending to bring comfort and succor to displaced more women. But in the process, she'd had an opportunity to see the concentration camp system from its inception through its growing development through the early part of 1901. She travelled widely. She'd been given a remarkable amount of access, given what would, of course, happen later on and what her report would have. And she had studied, interviewed, she had uh, um, spoken to both the inmates and the guards, the superintendents and so on. And crucially, she'd also collected photographs, which would have a sensational effect in Britain and Europe when they were published. 
She returned back to Britain in May 1901, so after having spent almost six months touring South Africa. Uh, she arrived back in Britain in June 1901, delivered a report on the state of the concentration camps to the British government, but crucially also went to the press with the story. The scandal exploded in Britain and led to the leader of the opposition Liberal Party, Henry Campbell Bannerman, memorably asking his party, when is a war not a war when it is carried on by methods of barbarism in South Africa? Up until this point, there have been rumours of the concentration camp system, but this full scale of the horrors of them had not been even grasped in Britain. Hobhouse's report, and crucially her photographs, brought no argument, and the government, embarrassed at home and abroad, reacted fairly swiftly. Hobhouse captured something about the camp system when she memorably described this as, this camp system is a wholesale cruelty, and to keep these camps going is murder to the children. And this was a message that could not be ignored by the government. Hophouse's report actually missed an element of the horrors that were to come because her report was issued just as the epidemic was beginning to take hold in the camps. But even what she'd already seen had convinced her of a looming uh, humanitarian disaster. Hophouse's report was sensational and it led to the government appointing the woman on the right, Millicent Fawcett, and the Fawcett Commission to go out and investigate the camps on behalf of the government. The Fawcett Commission was in some ways loaded with conservatives, conservative government, of course. Fawcett herself a liberal, but a unionist liberal who was generally favorable towards the war, as were the members of her ladies' commission. The government has been accused of trying to stack the odds in its favor by appointing pro-war um, inspectors, but even their report was damning on the conditions in the camps. They were given full access to the camps, toured primarily in the Orange Free State and the Transvaal, and made a number of important recommendations. Essentially, though, the Fawcett Commission confirmed what Hobhouse had reported some months earlier. Hophouse herself tried to regain access to South Africa, heading there in October 1901. She was initially denied entry by the authorities, and when she did finally make landing, she only was able to spend five days in South Africa before she was arrested and deported, giving rise to the right comment that the British Army seems deathly afraid of women. Crucially, even before the Fawcett Commission had completed its report, it completed in December 1901, the British government was moving to reform the camps. Secretary of State for the Colonies, Joseph Chamberlain, explicitly ordered Milner in South Africa to take charge of the camps and reduce the mortality rate. And although, of course, officially civilians had been in charge of the camps for some months at this stage, the constant clashes with the military, the constant clashes between who had authority over what and who had responsibility for what had contributed to this disaster. And Milner was told in no uncertain terms to take charge of the matter and ensure that the camps were brought uh, out of this epidemic as soon as possible. Widespread improvements for the camps followed. Better staff, better facilities, better rations. And this was also, though, aided by something that isn't widely commented on. And this is that the British Army stopped sending refugees, it was still creating these refugees, but it stopped sending them to the camps. Instead, it drove those refugees into the wilderness from December 1901 onwards and left them for the guerrillas to take care of. And indeed, by May 1902, when the war finally ended, uh, Louis Bota, the one of the Boer commando leaders, estimated about two and a half thousand Boer families were being sheltered in areas of wilderness, about 10,000 citizens in total, uh, because they were no longer being taken to the camps. And in some cases, the Boers actually took civilians to the edges of the camps and dropped them off there in the hope that they would be taken into the camps by 1902. So there's complexities to the improvements in the camp system in 1901. It was at least partially due to the fact that the army was no longer sending civilians there, but instead was driving them into the wilderness. A word on the a rather unknown element of the camps, and this is the African camps. The British also destroyed African property, black African property, to deny it as a form of supplies to the Boers. And from 90, early 1901 onwards, separate African camps were created to house the refugees being, uh, being uh, produced by this farm burning. These African camps were widespread. There were about 66 camps in total, so more than those for white citizens. <clears throat> the camps grew throughout 1901-1902 as Kitchener scourged the land. And 
African camps were different to um, uh, Boer camps. They were deliberately made harsh on the expectation that the men in the camps would work and that ultimately the camps themselves would become self-sufficient. Rations were only provided to the truly impoverished or those who desperately needed them. The facilities were extraordinarily limited. Hophouse never had a chance to visit the black camp. She actually wanted to visit them in October 1901 when she returned, but of course was deported. And she hoped the Fawcett Commission would take a look. But the Fawcett Commission never did. And so these camps largely proceeded as an unknown. The measles epidemic hit these camps in early 1902, so sometime later than the Boer camps, but hit them very hard. Although the death rate was not quite as high as in the Boer camps, this was largely due to the presence of able-bodied men in the Black African camps who were more resilient to these diseases, and it certainly doesn't show any less severity overall. To this day, the African camps remain a poorly understood story. The Documentary evidence for them is, is limited, and though there's been some excellent work by some South African historians on this subject, study of it is limited uh, by this simple lack of resources, lack of documentary evidence studying these or accounting for them. And in many cases, the archival record is incomplete and is difficult to piece together. It's worth commenting now, and this is a, a shocking image taken by, or at least the, the photograph brought back to Britain by Emily Hobhouse. It's worth commenting on the cost. In 1901, this was the iconic photograph of the horrors of the Boer War concentration camps. This is Lizzie van Zyl, aged seven, shortly before her death in May 1901. And as you can clearly see, she's in a terrible, emaciated state. The van Zyls were um, made homeless uh, some time before this period. Their husband and indeed Lizzie's father was a guerrilla fighter out on the campaign. And according to Hobhouse, who made a special study and took a special interest of Lizzie, Lizzie was treated extraordinarily poorly by the authorities. Indeed, the Van Zils were overall. They were categorised as undesirables. Their inability to speak English made them easy for mockery by the camp authorities. And Lizzie herself uh, was not given proper medical treatment and would die uh, soon after this photograph was taken. And this photograph, the, the release of this photograph in Britain was a truly uh, a seismic moment. And well, along with other photographs Hobhouse published at this time, brought home the undeniable horrors of the war and indeed the concentration camp system. The photograph of Lizzie here became emblematic of the suffering of Boer children in particular, and overwhelmingly it was Boer children who suffered in the concentration camps. Approximately 28,000 civilians died in the camps, but of those, about 22,000 were children under the age of 16. 4,000 were women and about 2,000 were men. The overall mortality rate in the camps was about 25%, and the total deaths within the, uh, the Africa, the concentration camps, represented somewhere in the region of 10% of the total pre-war Boer population. More Boers died in the concentration camps than actually died in the fighting between the um, British and Boer forces. African deaths in the Black African concentration camps, approximately the same, but estimates only, estimated about 28,000 to 30,000 Black Africans died in Black African concentration camps. There's also something that just to, to mention here, and this is something that the British did not perceive, but which was uh, important for those who survived, of course, this trauma. And this was the fact that this was a unique attack upon Boer culture. Boer culture was overwhelmingly independent. The Boers who ended up in the concentration camps were overwhelmingly rural. Relatively few urban Boers ended up in the camps. And for rural Boers, life on the frontier was one of independence, was one of self-sufficiency. And particularly for Boer women on the frontier, the home was very much a feminised space. The man, the masculine side, very much portrayed as protectors and providers, whereas the, the housewife and her daughters, the, the housewife, the vrouw, carried great weight in Boer society, great significance as homemakers, providers, nurturers. And to take that independence away and to take away the ability of Boer mothers to care for their children and to, indeed to raise their families, to place them in the restrictions of the camp, even beyond, of course, the epidemics and the suffering there, this was a, an attack on, on culture and an erosion of Boer values and Boer cultural values that the British never perceived but which would become a lingering source of resentment and pain in the Africana mind for decades to come. 
And worth commenting as we come to the finish about something about the legacy of the concentration camp system. <clears throat> the legacy in South Africa was obvious and it was emerging within 10 years uh, after this period, emerging perhaps getting its first comments with the Boer uprising in 1914 at the outbreak of the First World War, but becoming quite closely enshrined in Boer and Afrikaner national memory to the 1920s and especially the 1930s. The 1930s saw an explosion of interest in concentration camp memoirs, uh, almost overwhelmingly written by women or in some cases children who'd survived the camps and were now adults, that sold extremely well, not merely in South Africa, but also in Holland, where, or the Netherlands, I should say, where they were, of course, uh, shipped as well, and also in Germany, where they caught something of the public mood. The long-term legacy of the concentration camps was to, uh, to fuel Afrikaner nationalism and create a lingering scar between Afrikaner and British that would never fully heal. The legacy is more complicated than that, though, and this is where I this is something that I think is, is not widely understood and it is often quoted, is often mentioned, is often brought up. And that is the comment seen frequently in the Internet that the British invented the concentration camp. Of course, there's arguments about who exactly invented it, whether it was the Spanish in Cuba or the Americans in the Philippines. But what's more important is that this idea that the British invented the concentration camp and that it was uh, an appalling and a, a dreadful institution was largely a product of a highly successful Nazi Germany propaganda campaign, which began in the aftermath of Kristallnacht in 1938, when the German uh, propaganda ministry under Goebbels specifically began to seek examples by which to turn opinion, European opinion, against Britain, which was becoming increasingly critical of German actions. And a curious roundabout propaganda campaign took place in the 1930s, where the Germans attempted to contrast their own concentration camps, which of course were very different, extrajudicial prisons designed to punish, uh, humiliate and ultimately kill, against uh, other nations' concentration camps, whether these were Soviet gulags or, most specifically, British concentration camps in South Africa. The emphasis on the British inventing the concentration camp found a ready audience in Germany in the late 1930s, and the ideas also spread out into wider Europe. Memorably, the slogan given was that the British invented concentration camps and what camps they were, and the deflection away, of course, from the attention on Nazi Germany's camps was very deliberate and very specific. And this found perhaps its, its greatest expression, in fact, uh, with the film poster we can see here, Om Kruger, uh, Uncle Kruger, that's Paul Kruger, who was the president of the Transvaal at the outbreak of the war. And this is a German, uh, Nazi German propaganda film produced uh, to stir up anti-British sentiment, not merely in Germany, but also in occupied Europe. It culminates in a, an appalling scene in a British concentration camp in which women and children are massacred, they're hanged, they're mown down by British soldiers, and there's, a, there's an agonizing lingering shot of the effects of this massacre uh, at the camp. And the lingering effects of this, of course, are still seen today, particularly in the online sphere where people make quick calls and so on, and the, the phrase, the British invented the concentration camp, whenever I see it, I, I think it emphasizes uh, perhaps not what the author intends, but in fact emphasizes that complex legacy that still hangs over this process. What we can say, though, is that the concentration camps received almost universal condemnation in their own time, and deservedly so. They were a disaster of the British military's own making. By creating a refugee crisis and then failing to deal with it, it laid the seeds for an inevitable humanitarian disaster. Although perhaps not guided by malice, the incompetence of the administration of the camps, the lack of urgency in reforming them, and the incredible administrative black holes that formed between the civilian administration and the military authorities guaranteed a tragedy of immense proportions was all but inevitable. And one does wonder if it had not been for the in many ways, heroic efforts of Emily Hobhouse in investigating the story and bringing it to, a gl to global attention, at some risk to her reputation, not to mention possibly even her safety. One wonders about what else may have happened. And more than anybody, it was Emily Hobhouse who was able to turn the tide of this humanitarian disaster, but not, of course, before it had claimed tens of thousands of lives, primarily children. It was a disaster that was eminently avoidable in many ways, but it was one that was sadly not avoided.
And perhaps because of the importance of Emily Hobhouse, she is, of course, commemorated here at the Women's Memorial in Bloemfontein, South Africa, which remembers the victims of the concentration camps of the Boer War. At this point, I bring my presentation to a conclusion, and I'd be very happy to take any questions that you may have. And of course, if we don't have time to reach your question tonight, I'd also be happy to engage you on Twitter. I do drop me a line at historian1914. Thank you very much for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you, Spencer. As always, that was an absolutely brilliant presentation. And we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. So if you haven't asked a question yet and you do have one, please remember to put that in the Q&A box rather than the chat box so that I can get to it. Um, so the first question that's come in is from John Murray, and he's asking who were the Boers? Um, and at first, the Dutch had superior artillery and the Germans were joining the Boers. So could you explain that a little bit more, please? Um, very briefly, yes. Yeah. So the Boers were descendants of the original Dutch settlers who'd actually arrived on the west coast of South Africa, what's now Cape Town, in the 1600s. And Cape Town was settled as a reprovisioning station for Dutch shipping heading from the Dutch East Indies uh, back to Europe. The area didn't really attract much immigration difficult conditions and so on. The population was about 40,000 Dutch speakers by the early 1800s, at which point the British actually took control of Cape, Cape Town and indeed Cape Colony during the Napoleonic Wars and brought under their, their rule the Dutch settlers. The Dutch settlers have been there now for several hundred years and they developed a very distinctive culture. Indeed, they didn't describe themselves as Dutch anymore. They described themselves as Afrikaners, quite literally Africans. The word Afrikaner and Boer essentially synonymous. Boer just means farmer in Afrikaans. The two, the British and the Boers could not get along. They had differing legal systems, differing interpretations of Christianity and many other problems, which culminated in the 1830s when a large chunk of the Boer population in British Cape Colony decided to migrate in what's called the Great Trek, migrate east and found their own homelands independent of British rule. And that eventually led to the founding of the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. And they'd actually fought a war against Britain in, the, in 1880 and 81, the first Boer War, which secured Boer independence. But then the discovery of gold and diamonds in that territory, uh, just a few years after that victory for the Boers, all but guaranteed that they would come under the, uh, the avaricious eyes of British imperialists and led to the war in 1899. That there was a question too about the German involvement, but I, I just missed it. Could you repeat that, please, Sarah? Um, John just mentioned the Germans joining the Boers. Have you got any information about that? Have you looked into it? So the, the two two elements. First of all, that there was a there were a number of foreign um, military units that uh, joined the Boers, and they were, were be known by their nationality. So so there was the Scandinavian commando, the Hollander commando, the French commando, and there was the German commando, which is also sometimes known as the German Legion. These were actually made up largely from citizens of those nations who were living in South Africa before the war, but they were in some cases joined by adventurers, uh, rogues in some cases, who went out to actually join the fighting. Um, the German Legion actually was very badly smashed at one of the opening battles of the war, and it never really recovered. Um, it was still fighting until quite late in the war, uh, but was the, the European volunteer detachments tended, not always, but tended to lay their arms down as it became clear that the war was, at, war was coming to an end and they did not join the guerrilla fighting. Germany as a nation itself sold the Boers a lot of weaponry prior to the war and the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, briefly, half jokingly, half seriously proposed that Germany, France and Russia intervene in the war, intervene diplomatically to try and force Britain to uh, to, to bring it to an end. Germany and, and the Dutch republics actually had very close diplomatic links, um, but it went no further than that in the course of the war. Thank you. So I'm going to group a couple of questions together here because they're all historical. So John again is asking, did the Romans not have concentration camps? Um, and that brings us forward to a question from Simon Sundaraj Kuhn, who's asking um, about the parallels that can be drawn about the usage of concentration camp systems during the Second Boer War with Britain's small wars in Africa and Malaya from the 1950s to 60s. Mm. And lastly, we have a question <laughs> about from Derek Blair that asks, is there a parallel between the Boer War concentration camps and the camps that are currently being maintained to contain the families of ISIS fighters? So um, the first question was about Roman concentration camps. Um, I'm afraid I have no idea 
absolutely no idea. That's a, a bit out of my time period, but um, uh, so I'll have to I'll have to play that one uh, into the long grass. In terms of, of comparisons with other camps, that there is an interesting argument here about where the Boer camps fit into to wider British military history. For example, the, the British actually had camps for Indian refugees within uh, British India. Indian refugees who've been forced off the land due to famine or due to drought and so forth. And there's there's some comparisons between the two, although the, the Boer camps there's no reference to those earlier to, to Indian camps in the historical record at all. Um, they weren't really considered. In terms of resettling population in Malaya, um, this, these were, in some respects, although you can't, I, I've certainly never seen this, and I stand to be corrected, I've never seen direct comparison between the two. Um, the idea of relocating troublesome population and moving it away and, and uh, isolating fighters was not necessarily uh, an entirely new one. Of course, they could draw both on the Boer War and also other examples, for example, Burma uh, in the earlier period, where it had been effective. I've not seen in, in paperwork relating to Malaya any direct reference to the concentration camp, so we'd have to rather stretch this uh, a little bit here. And the other question um, was about camps and, and ISIS fighters and so on. I'm afraid I'm just not qualified to, to really comment on the, the camps there. Um, sl some it's the difficulty, I think, of administration, perhaps, is, is worthy of comments. Just This is um, just what I uh, understand about some of the camps for ISIS fighters, difficulties of administrating this in the face of very hostile inmates and so forth, lack of supplies, lack of urgency, a sense that the, the inmates are the enemy and therefore are and not deserving of particular treatment. There's, there's definitely some comparisons there, but I'd be wary of drawing too much because of course, we're living in very different eras with very different mindsets and so on. And that the mindset in 1901 was radically different to the mindset now in 2022. Absolutely, thank you. So Harry Ross has asked us, um, or asked you rather, regarding the African camps, why do you suppose that such a small amount of documentary evidence exists in comparison to the white camps? There's, there's two potential arguments for this. The first is that the camps, the, the Boer camps, I should add, were often poorly administered. There was a, a lack of bookkeeping in some of the camps. The, the record for the Boer camps is not complete, um, although it's much better. And I think this was largely due to the Fawcett Commission coming around and demanding to see paperwork. With the African camps, these were even less resourceful or had fewer resources than the, the Boer camps. Uh, the administration of these, I suspect, was poor. I suspect there was little interest in producing paperwork. Um, and the, the, the superintendents and indeed their assistants were largely allowed to get away with it. Simply nobody asked to see it. There was also a perception that, so I think there was a degree of administrative laziness. The second reason, I think, is that... <clears throat> There was a sense, and one can really pick this up actually from the archival record, that the African camps looked after themselves. It was a little bit of making the wish the father of the thought that the British assumed because the camps were intended to be self-sufficient, they had become self-sufficient. And so they didn't really, pay, the authorities didn't pay a great deal of attention to them and, and rather left them uh, to their own devices. And so I think those two factors contribute to this. I'd also add a third potential factor, and this is speculation, uh, I must say, and that's that any paperwork that did remain there would seem to be little interest in keeping it. Um, large amounts of Boer War records were lost in general during this conflict. And for camps that didn't have a great deal of paperwork produced and there seemed to be no interest in it in the world of 1901-1902, I suspect that what paperwork may have existed may well have simply been lost in the intervening century. Thank you. So we'll go over to Phil Mead, who's writing from the Netherlands, and he asks, what was the most important driver behind the concentration camps? So was it to punish the Boer guerrillas, destroy morale, or seen as a means to defeat them off the battlefield? Um, and in the use of concentration camps as a military tactics, how did the British define victory? That's a really interesting question. And I think it also speaks to some of the confusion that's inherent in the British civil military response to the guerrilla phase of the Boer War. The problem with the camps was, particularly during Kitchener's reign, is it wasn't entirely clear what they were there for. Milner hoped that the camps would actually encourage Boers to surrender so that they could go and live with their families again, that they would be living in, in sheltered and, and relatively comfortable accommodation. That was Milner's outlook on it. Kitchener paid very little attention to the camps, and, and this was part of the problem. Kitchener's idea was to simply scour the land, destroy all means of supply, and, and force the Boers um, to the force the Boer fighters to just give up through sheer exhaustion and lack of materials. And Kitchener paid very little attention 
to what happened to the Boer civilians. This was part of this civil military clash. The British would sweep through an area, destroy Boer town, villages, farms, and then would simply ship thousands of Boer women and children into a camp that was already overcrowded and say, that's a civilian's problem now. And so there was no joined up policy towards the camps. The military saw them as some a place to send civilians, and the civil authorities were desperate really to try and get rid of the camps and get civilian society back to normal. The extent to which the camps eroded Boer morale is also very, very questionable. It certainly enraged the Boers, and there were a number of raids on um, concentration camps, both uh, Boer concentration camps and African concentration camps, by Boer commandos uh, during the fighting. But the extent to which it encouraged surrenders um, seems to be almost negligible. And of course, as the epidemics began to sweep to the camps, the idea of surrendering to these camps was simply intolerable. What does seem to have affected Boer morale much, much greater than the concentration camps was the policy from December 1901 of sending civilians into the wilderness for the Boer commandos to try and care for. And that seems to have had a much greater effect on, on Boer morale uh, than the camps. But I hope I've got across to you that there simply wasn't a coherent military policy behind these camps. There was, in fact, a clash between the civil and military authorities, and it, it, it led to led to tragedy. Boer morale ultimately collapses for, I say collapses, that's a little bit strong. It ultimately reaches the point where the Boers can fight on no longer for a variety of factors. The key one is probably simple lack of supply. As appalling as it is, Kitchener's scorched earth policy is brutally effective. And by April, May 1902, the Boers are dependent on capturing British uh, weapons and ammunition. They're short of food. They're dependent on captured British clothing and so forth. Their horses are in very poor state. Uh, and they simply can go on no longer with any reasonable prospect of success. So that, that, that we could, we could do, do an entire talk on the actual military side of this, but that's a summary of the issue. Thank you. And as we've got about five minutes left, I'm just going to see if we can get through two to three more questions before we come to a close. So that takes us over to John Casey, who's asked what happened to the camp inmates after the peace? So were they given any assistance with rebuilding their destroyed farms or were they just turned loose to fend for themselves? <laughs> The reconstruction of, of South Africa after the war is absolutely fascinating and, again, could be a lecture in itself. The reconstruction period is, is defined by the same kind of administrative incompetence that creates the concentration camp system. The British government had budgeted about £3 million for reconstructing the damaged areas of South Africa, but they come up with this figure largely by guesswork in about 1901, and they'd never revised it. Um, They'd also completely underestimated the sheer difficulty of emptying the concentration camps into a countryside where there was nowhere for the former inmates to live. The reconstruction of South Africa dragged on and as late as 1903, there were still a handful of Boers who were still stuck in camps because they simply had nowhere else to go. Um, Reconstruction largely proceeded through Boer efforts in many ways, that people simply wanted to leave the camps if they had able-bodied um, members of the family. They would go back out into the countryside and try and reconstruct. But of course, it's not just about building a farm building. You've also then got to get your, your herd. You've got to um, plant your, your uh, crops and so on. And that was going to take a long time. The administration was extremely poor. There weren't enough administrators. There was a general assumption that the problem would solve itself. And I'm afraid it didn't. And in fact, the, the population of the Orange Free State in Transvaal was so greatly denuded by the war, by, of course, the death rate of the war and the failure of people to return. Many people had fled South Africa and had gone to elsewhere. Um, that the, 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 the area probably didn't recover properly until the eve of the First World War. So it, it took an extraordinarily long time. Um, but that's I could talk for quite a long time about that. But ultimately, the, the British authorities greatly underestimated the cost and the difficulty. And ultimately, it was down to individual families to really carve a new path for themselves after the period of war. Brilliant. It sounds like we could almost invite you for another talk. So I guess if anyone would like us to invite Spencer back, do let us know on Twitter. Um, so I'll take you to potentially a last question. We'll see how we get on. But this is from Paul Lindy. And he asks, has there been any research done into the differences in fertility rates between camps? So were there any camps that were well run with lower fertility rates while others had much higher? Um, there is. Uh, there's a, a very interesting website, which if you're interested in this, I'd, I'd recommend um, you can find it by searching for Anglo Boer War concentration camps. And it's an attempt by South African historians to create a database of camps. And what emerges from this is that although just about all the camps were hit by the measles epidemic, which began to arrive around about August 1901, some camps were well run. 
And some camps um, featured permanent structures rather than tents. Some camps featured, you know, a high, I say, a high standard of life, a high standard by the standards of concentration camps. And I think this is actually the the, uh, the database project has been very illuminating in showing that the radical differences between some camps, some camps were tolerable uh, to live in and they, their overall death rate was lower than others, but others were built in, in truly disastrous positions, were appallingly run. And so I do recommend if you're interested in the differences between individual camps, search for, for the anglo Boer War concentration camp database, and you can read assessments of each camp written by historians um, on their mortality rates and so on. And if you're interested in that, you'll find a wealth of information there. That sounds like a brilliant resource. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and we'll wrap up with the final question then. And this is from Roger Kilshaw. And he just asks, what would you recommend as the best contemporary account? Uh, contemporary in terms of uh, written at the time. Um, that's that's very interesting. There's, there's I, I, would get, I would offer you two. I'd offer you two. The first is... Um, should I offer you two or offer you three? Um, <laughs> uh, it's, I may have to come back to you for, for reading, but I do recommend Emily Hobhouse's own work um, on this. And I just the name of her book, which I think is called Where the War Fell or Where the, the Worst the War Fell, which was published, of course, this searing book about this, which includes some remarkable photographs. But Hobhouse's early work is really recommended on this. Um, Hobhouse went out, remember, she wasn't expecting to study the camps. They were only formed as she was sailing out there. And although some historians have questioned, you know, argued that she was by no means an unbiased witness, I think that there's a rawness and there's a truthfulness in her account uh, that is very, very powerful. And, and I do recommend that, that quite highly. If you'd like a blander account, and this is, it's got some interesting photographs. It's an interesting counterpoint to Hob, um, uh, Emily Hobson because it's, it's very much a sort of um, pro-British approach. Uh, a Wilson's After Pretoria, which is actually a pictorial book uh, based on a series of magazines that were published at the time. After Pretoria is about the guerrilla phase of the war and features some quite unusual photographs you won't see anywhere else. And it's a much blander version. And it can make for an interesting comparison to read the accounts of what the camps are like there with what Emily um, Hobhouse is saying about what they actually were like when she saw them. So there's two interesting contemporary accounts that you might enjoy. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. And thank you very much to our audience as well for all your brilliant questions. I'm really sorry that we couldn't get round to those. But as Spencer has mentioned, if you are on Twitter, please do get in touch um, and he'll be happy to answer your questions there. So just to bring us to a close, I'd just like to let you know that the next and fifth event in the military history series will be scheduled for the 21st of February from 9.30 a.m. The subject will be the Malayan emergency. So General Sir Tem General Sir Gerald Templer arrived as the new British High Commissioner for Malaya in January 1952, which makes it the 70th, 70th anniversary this year, and initiated effective strategies to defeat the Malayan National Liberation Army of terrorist guerrillas. Professor Kumar Ramakrishna will speak on the subject, and he will be followed by Professor Ong Wei Chong, who will speak on the second Malayan emergency from 1968 to 1989. Both of our speakers are from the South... Ra Roger Ratanam School of International Security Studies and Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And details of that event will be available on the RUSI website. So thank you again to our speaker. It was a brilliant presentation as always. And I really do hope that we can speak to you again on this subject because it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank, thank you to much. our audience. Thank you to our events team and thank you to